Good. good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's good to see all your faces here. We're about to open one of the most sacred sections of scripture here in the book of Mark. It's the very center of history. It's, it's the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. So we're in chapter 15 today. And so we're going to look at all of the circumstances and everything that happened when Jesus was put on the cross. Mark's take is very condensed. And so there are other things that are not put in there. And I'll try to fill in the timeline for you, but I don't want to get too bogged down with all of the details. There's a little thing called the... Uh, um, and and they're, they're, I, gave it to, I gave it to Joan, and I remember looking at it. It's the Harmony of the Gospels, where they have all four of the Gospels, and they put everything on a timeline for you so that you can actually read from four different points of view everything that occurred in its line. I'm going to do my best to fill in what I think are some important facts, but we're not going to get everything from Mark, just so that you understand. But the crucifixion and just the facts is, is Mark's uh, way of just putting the facts down, um, writing them down as Peter, the apostle, gave them to him. So we're going to be looking at the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, without which we would all be doomed. Amen. Because without God's grace, we, we really have nothing. So let's pray. Father, I pray that you help us today as we open your word, as it goes forward, that, that you might spur our minds to thought and that you might soften our hearts to feeling, that we might enter into what it is that you did for us at the cross. I know myself, Lord, there was a day when I gave you my life and you changed everything, and I'm still trying to figure out everything that you did that day as it is with us. I pray that you help us, that we might have a clearer picture of your love, that we might have a greater sense of our response to you because of your love. And I pray that you might help us in that, Lord, because in and of ourselves, we'll, our minds will wander and we'll try to avoid thinking about our unworthiness. And yet when faced with perfection, we can't help but feel that way. So, Lord, I pray you be with us now, that your spirit would be in this place upon all the hearers, and that we would change. Walk with us now, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so as we open up chapter 15, I'm going to let you know what we went over previously at Grace. We looked at Peter's denial when Jesus was captured in the garden and he was taken away. We see that Peter and John and John Mark, at least for a short period of time, they follow Jesus behind the soldiers. They try to grab John Mark and uh, he runs away naked because they tear what he's wearing for clothes off. And Peter and John go and follow up behind Jesus. John knows somebody on the inside, and so he's able to get inside of where this midnight courtroom is being held illegally for Jesus. And uh, we see Peter warming himself by the fire of all the enemies of Christ. Uh, first of all, he was following at a distance, and then we see him warming himself by the fire. And it's a picture of backsliding, really. Um, we can follow Jesus at a distance and not really have that relationship like we should. And before you know it, you're going to be trying to warm yourself at the world's fire, at the, at the enemy's fire, trying to keep warm with the things of the world, which will never, ever, um, you'll never be able to hide. There have been times I, I wish I could hide from being a Christian, and I wish I could go back to being the person I was, because... Jesus changed me so much that I can't enjoy the things of this world anymore. And I, and I really can't enjoy the things of God if I'm going to be like Peter and follow him at a distance. Because then I'm going to be living a sloppy life and I'm going to be trying to warm myself by the world's fire, which never satisfies. Amen? Amen. 
so we saw Peter's denial, even though he said, everyone's going to leave you, but I'll never leave you, Lord. Such boasting in his own pride. And Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the, the crow, you're going to hear the crow of the rooster twice, and you will have denied me three times this night. And uh, Peter just continued to say, no way. And then all the other disciples said, yeah, 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 us too. But then it comes true, exactly as Jesus said, not a surprise to any of us. And Peter looks at Jesus and he weeps bitterly as he runs out of the temple. We see there's a choice between Barabbas and Jesus. Barabbas, whose name means son of the father, Bar means son, Abbas, father. He's Jesus, the son of the father. And we have Jesus, the true son of the father. So we have a picture of an antichrist who's a murderer. And Pilate, having three strikes against him with Caesar, has already made enemies of Caesar because he's done some crazy things and caused riots himself with his overarching power. He's uh, ripped off the Jews to make an aqueduct. He's, he's brought pictures of Caesar into the temple area, which is, as far as they're concerned, is breaking the second commandment of the ten, uh, making a graven image and bowing down and worshiping it. Caesar claimed to be God, so it was like having another God in the house of God. And so they rioted. And so there were all these things that he, there were three things that he did. And finally, uh, Jesus comes before. They're all crying out for his death. And he, he interviews him and he says, are you the king of the Jews? He says, you said it. And then he comes out and he goes, I don't find anything wrong with this guy. <laughs> and he didn't defend himself. And he was quiet like a sheep before his shears is dumb. And so he opened not his mouth. And he, he, was, he was amazed at that. So we see Jesus, even before a Roman officer being questioned, being found innocent, he was declared innocent, even by his enemies. And they couldn't get anything to stick when they tried making uh, accusations during the court. So Pilate has this chance, and he's trying to get out of persecuting Jesus because he knows he's an innocent man. And he knows he was turned over for envy. And so he goes, listen, it's, it's the feast time, and it's time when I normally release a soldier to you, so, uh, well, one of the prisoners to you. So which one do you want? You want this murderer, or do you want Jesus, the king of the Jews? And the, all of the Pharisees and the elders and scribes, they get the, the people to cry out that they want Barabbas released. And he tries, and he tries, and he tries. And finally, Pilate comes out, and he washes his hands. And he says, listen, I don't find anything wrong with this guy. You take him away, do whatever you want to do. But I find nothing wrong with him. The very fact that he washed his hands doesn't make him innocent, does it? But what he's trying to do is wash his hands of Jesus. Because he doesn't need another problem. And so instead of standing up and doing the right thing, he just cowers to public opinion. You know what that looks like, right? He's a typical politician. And so he puts Jesus into the back and they call the whole garrison out and they whip him and they whip him and they whip him. There's 39 lashes that they give him with this flagrum, which has leather straps and it has bits of metal balls woven into it along with sharp pieces of metal. And they basically land into his back and tear strips of his skin off. And people have died just from the beating because their, all their internal organs fall out the back of them. Their ribs are exposed. And there's great detail if you want to read some of the writings of Josephus and some of the others. They'll give you actual firsthand accounts of what it was like uh, when that happened. So Jesus is beaten within an inch of his life. He gets mocked by the guards. They put a purple garment. So they strip him of his clothes. So he's naked, by the way. All of the movies you've ever seen dress it up so he doesn't look naked, but he's naked. And that's how they beat him. And that's how they hung him on the cross, naked. Stripped him of his clothes, whipped him, threw this purple garment on him, pressed a crown of thorns on his head, and began to mock worship him. And as they did that, they blindfolded him and began to hit him. And they said, okay, prophesy, tell us, who hit you? And Jesus submitted himself to that. 
I find it hard to get up and go to church in the morning sometimes. Jesus submitted himself to this, and he did it because he loved you. And he loved me, which is harder to believe. So this is the phylagrum that was used, and this is how he would be strapped out. Sometimes they would put you between two poles and spread you this way, and sometimes they would just spread you out on a pole with your hands up over your head, and your back would be completely raw. So after they were done with that, they put this purple garment on him. They tore it off just as the blood began to coagulate, and they put his own clothes back on him. And he was bruised. And it says it pleased the Lord to bruise him. It pleased the Lord to put him to grief because he knew it would mean our redemption. Amen. So God created this plan. He allowed this to happen. And it pleased God to have all of this happen to his own son for you. I don't think I appreciate the depth of that. But I should. So this week, we're going to look at the crucifixion and look a little bit further. In verse 21, and then they compelled a certain man, Simon, a Cyrenian, the father of Alexander and Rufus, and he was coming out of the country and passing by to bear his cross, the cross of Jesus. And they brought him to the place of Golgotha, which is translated place of the skull. And so they, because Jesus stumbled and fell, and we see from the other Gospels, it explains that he could no longer, because of the blood loss, because of the weakness in his legs, because of having no sleep whatsoever and being tortured through the night, he just could not carry that, that beam any longer and was falling. And so the Romans had the right to be able to volunteer anyone they wanted to, and they grabbed a guy from Cyrene, uh, by the way, no, this is where Cyrene is. It's in Africa. Just like, uh, did you know Egyptians are Africans? <laughs> and Libyans are Africans. Well, he's a Cyrene, which is even further out, uh, more towards where the desert area is. And so he just grabs this guy who happens to be just walking by. And he was made to carry the cross of Jesus Christ. What a privilege that would be, right? And Jesus says in another place, he says, unless you're willing to take up your cross and follow me, you're not worthy to be my disciple. <coughs> it's interesting because it tells us that this man, Simon, was the father of Alexander and Rufus. Alexander and Rufus, we know, are key Christian figures a little bit later on, like in Romans chapter 16. They're mentioned as part of the church. So I wonder if this event did not do something to Simon's heart, that Simon the Cyrenian, and cause him to put his faith in Christ. Because he's carrying the beam that's covered with blood. It's covered with the blood of Jesus Christ. Which, you know, if you've got to be covered in blood, that's the blood to be covered with. Amen? Amen? Because it's the only blood that cleanses us of our sins by having faith in his finished work. And so... This Cyrenian who was just elected to come is now carrying the cross with Jesus or for Jesus to the place of the skull. This is the hill on which Jesus was mounted up onto a cross. And you see what looks like a skull in the side of the, the mountain there. Um, it actually looked more like a skull in years gone by. Uh, erosion has taken it down a little bit. And there's some story behind that actually. Golgotha, the place of the skull, is, uh, according to Jewish tradition, the place where Shem buried Adam. So, and they found a skull there, and they believed it was the skull of Adam, the first man. It also is purported that it's the place that David brought Goliath's head when he cut his head off. And so the place of the skull has more than just the appearance of the stone on the wall. It also has a history of uh, skulls being put there. The early Christian, his name is Origen, who lived from 185 to 253 AD, recorded that Jesus was crucified on the spot where Adam was buried and where his skull had been found. As this early story goes, when the earthquake occurred, as Jesus hung on the cross, that his blood ran down the cross into the crack of the rock below and fell on the skull of Adam. 
This history is so entrenched in the early Christian tradition that Jerome referred to it in a letter in 386 AD. So whether it's true or not, don't know, but there is history, extra biblical history, that says that this is the place where Adam's... Now, it's interesting because Jesus in the book of, Rad... in the book of Romans is called the second Adam. You see, God put man on the earth, and he was perfect in every way, and he had just one thing to do. Just don't touch the tree. You got one job. Except he ate from that tree, and now we're all, we're all doomed, unfortunately, without Christ. And so that Adam failed his test. Jesus, the God-man, he passed the test with flying colors. And so you'll see in a lot of old pictures like this with Jesus on the cross, you'll see a, a skull down below it. And it's to denote that it's on the place of the skull where Adam's skull was found, supposedly. So it's interesting. They have uh, lots of skulls floating around that are supposedly belonging to people. Some, some they have multiple, like the skull of Mary Magdalene. They have the skull of John the Baptist. Uh, they actually have three skulls of John the Baptist, so it's <laughs> kind of hard to know what's going on there. So they take him to Golgotha, and they gave him wine mingled with myrrh to drink, but he did not take it. And when they crucified him, they divided his garments, casting lots for them to determine what every man should take. And so what they would typically do is give you this wine that has myrrh or gall mixed inside of it. It's an anesthetic. It's not designed to have mercy on the person being tortured. It's designed to prolong it. You're talking about some seriously sadistic people here. So that you don't feel the pain and die of a heart attack or of shock so that you'd be able to endure it. And they felt that this was justice for you to be tortured until you died. Some people would hang on the cross for days before they would actually die. You typically die of asphyxiation. You die of drowning because your lungs fill with water. And the pericardium, the area around the heart, begins to fill with water inflammation, and it begins to impede your heart so that you can't circulate your blood and you can't breathe because you're hanging on the weight of your arms and your lungs are filling with fluid. The only way for you to get a breath is to push up on your nailed feet so that you can get a breath and then relax, except you're relaxing on the weight of your hands, which are nailed. It's an excruciating way to die. The Romans didn't invent it, but they perfected it. And so Jesus was then hung on a cross, and we're given some more feedback from the other Gospels. This is when Jesus looks and he says to them, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Jesus refused the anesthetic because he was, he was taking upon himself the wrath of God that we rightfully have earned. And he was going to drink it all. And he wasn't going to take any shortcuts. And so... These guys are true materialists, the Romans. While he's dying, they say, well, you know, we got his clothes. That was kind of like the tip for them doing this really rotten duty in this rotten town. And so they split up his clothes, which were covered in blood, and they get to one of the pieces of his clothing, which is typically made by his mother, and it's sewn all in one piece, and they didn't want to tear it because it's a, it's a one piece. I don't think it was a onesie. But it, it was a, a one-piece thing, undergarment, that your mother would typically make for you. And they didn't want to ruin it, and so they cast lots, or, or they, you know, uh, odd and even sort of thing, uh, you know, or rolling, rolling the bones to see who would win. Even as it says in Psalm 22, 18, it says, They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. It's interesting, both of those things are in Psalm 22, long before Jesus ever came, a prophecy about the Messiah, how he would come, and that they would separate the clothing and they would draw lots for it. How, how perfect is that? Yeah, they couldn't have written that prophecy. Yeah, God can, and he did. And now it was the third hour, 
and they crucified him. The third hour is 9 a.m., by the way. And the inscription of his accusation was written above, the king of the Jews. And with him, they also crucified two robbers, one on his right and the other on his left. And so the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and he was numbered with the transgressors. Jesus was hung up like a common criminal. It was actually, it was Barabbas's spot. And he actually took Barabbas's spot and Barabbas went free. Just like you and I, when we put our faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. It says in the third hour, they crucified him. And this inscription said the king of the Jews. It was in three languages so everybody could read it. It was in Latin because that was the language of the law at that time so that they could actually read what his accusation was. It was also written in Aramaic and Hebrew. So everybody could read it. And and there was nobody walking by that wouldn't know what it said. We get that from the other passages. In Psalm 22, this messianic psalm about the one who would come is, for dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. This is, this is a thousand years before Jesus ever came and crucifixion wasn't even a way to die when this was written. When you look at all of the prophecies made about Jesus and you start stacking them up and you look at the chances of them happening by chance, it, it just can't. They pierce my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them, and from my clothing they cast lots. This is like a first-person explanation of what Jesus is going through up on the cross. And it's just spot-on prophecy. You don't have to stretch anything or try to configure anything or reword anything. It's just, this is exactly how it happened. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha! You who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also mocking among themselves with the scribes said, he saved others. Himself he cannot save. Do you understand how right they are? He can't save himself. If you're going to get saved, he can't. Himself he cannot save. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. Even those who were crucified with him reviled him. The other gospels tell us about the thieves on both sides begin blaspheming him. The one says, if you're really the Christ, why don't you get us all down from here? You know, everybody's a pal in prison if you're breaking out, you know. And it says that the other one also was blaspheming, but he begins to look on Jesus and he begins to change his mind and he hears all the accusations and his heart begins to change up there on the cross. And he looks to Jesus and he says, Lord, so he recognizes his authority. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And that's all he said. And Jesus said, Truly, I tell you, you will be with me this day in paradise. He didn't have to sacrifice an animal. He didn't have to get circumcised. He didn't have to get baptized. He didn't have to attend church. He didn't have to do anything, but he believed, like Abraham, when he believed and it was credited to him as righteousness. It's always been by faith alone. In John 1, 10 to 12, the apostle writes, he was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. He came to his own, meaning his own creation, and his own, means his own people, did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. That's it. It's believing in the finished work of Jesus Christ, that he is who he said he is, and that his sacrifice applies to you. 
that's what changed me. That's what changed us. Amen? Amen. In Isaiah 53, another prophetic passage about the coming of the Messiah said, He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him and by his stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Amen. Without this event in history, we would be lost. We would have no hope. But God shows his love that even while we were still sinners, Christ came and died for us. How can I have a selfish bone in my body? How can I think I'm going to force my will against something I know God doesn't want? How can, why do I think I ever have a possibility to do that when Jesus has done all this for me and for you? It gives me a sense of deep awe and obligation. Now, when the sixth hour had come, that's 12 noon, by the way, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, which is three o'clock. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood by when they heard that said, look, he's calling upon Elijah. And then someone ran and filled a sponge full of sour wine and they put it on a reed and they offered it to him to drink, saying, let him alone. Let's see if Elijah will come and take him down. You got to wonder who in the world thought that he was calling on Elijah when it's the word for God. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why are you... So far from hearing my cry comes the rest of the psalm. We're back to Psalm 22 again, as Jesus is hanging there, asking his father to forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. He said he thirsts. And so what they did is they raised up this sponge. It's called a hyssop, by the way. It's this sponge, and they attached it to a reed, and they dipped it in this vinegar, this sour wine, and they lifted it to his lips because at this point, all the moisture had left his body. He wasn't able to speak. Now, it didn't have the myrrh in it. It didn't have the, the, the anesthetic or the painkiller. It was just vinegar, which if you're thirsty, that's not something you want to drink. But it was enough so that he could say his last words. His last words were, it is finished. Jesus came to accomplish this. This wasn't a tragedy. This wasn't a failure. This wasn't, uh, you know, I want to teach the world to sing. And there's no peace and harmony. And so they killed Jesus. And oh my goodness, it's a terrible thing. God didn't see this coming. It's not like that. This was intended for your good, for my good. And so they put this vinegar on this hyssop and lifted it to his lips so that he could say his last words. It's interesting because this is the Passover and there are homes everywhere in Jerusalem who are taking the blood of a lamb on a hyssop and putting it on the doorposts and the lintel of their house in celebration of Passover. It's the very same sponge that's being used here for Jesus. In Psalm 22 is what Jesus was quoting my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which is Jesus signaling us. Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? But I am a worm and no man. A reproach of men and despised by the people. 
All those who see me ridicule me, and they shoot out their lip, and they shake the head, saying, He trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. Which is exactly what they were saying at the cross. And this is King David writing this prophetic psalm far, far into the past about the Messiah who would come. And it fits the exact event of Jesus' death. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice. And we know that he says, it is finished to tell us die. And he breathed his last. Then the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. So when the centurion who stood outside opposite him saw that he cried out like this and he breathed his last and he said, truly, this man was the son of God. We see Pilate previously washing his hands and he says, I find nothing wrong with this man. He's completely innocent. We see a Roman soldier who's there at his death and he says, this was the son of God. There was an earthquake at that very moment. That earthquake caused the rocks to split. And it says that there were those who were dead that walked around Jerusalem afterwards. That was the living dead really happening. That's where the, the movie came from <laughs> and got twisted. And this veil, which was the separation between the holy place and the most holy place in the temple, was torn from top to bottom as though God himself tore it. It was that which kept people away from God. And Jesus' body was broken so that we might have access to God freely. And there were also women looking on from afar, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, the less, because there's, there's big James and little James, and, and of Joseph, and Salome, who also followed him and ministered to him when he was in Galilee, and many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. I find it amazing that no one stuck around except for women and children. All the disciples were gone. All of, even Big Peter, I'll never deny you. He wasn't there. But the women were there. And it wasn't a problem for the Romans because the Romans didn't present a problem. Uh, the, the women didn't present a problem for the Roman soldiers. And John, the apostle, was there. He's standing there with Jesus' mother, Mary. And he goes to Mary. He said, behold your son, meaning John. And John said, Behold your mother. And so even while on the cross about to die, Jesus was thinking about the good of his mom, putting her in the care of John, who was the only one at the cross, the only one of the disciples, and he was a young teenager. And it said from that time forward, John took her into his house. Now, when evening had come, because it was the preparation day, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent council member, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, coming and taking courage, went into Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate marveled that he was already dead. And summing the centurion, he asked him if he had been dead for some time. So he wants to make sure that he's not going to take the body of Jesus before he's completely dead. He doesn't want him mostly dead. He wants him all dead. And because it was the sun was going to go down, the religious rulers said, could we speed this up? We've got a festival to go to. So what they would do is break your legs. They would come over to you and they would crack you on the upper thigh and snap that bone on both legs and you would not be able to breathe because you couldn't push up to catch your breath anymore. And you would suffocate. So they went to Jesus' body and they saw that he had already died. And so they didn't break his legs. You know, in the Passover lamb, when the lamb is to be sacrificed, you're not to break any of its bones. And the, in the Old Testament, they don't even know why. The sacrificial lamb for Passover, you're not to break any of its bones. Why would God set such a silly thing? Because Jesus would come and his bones would not be broken and he was the sacrifice lamb. 
So God has all these things which we think are minutia, and yet they all point back to him, don't they? Amen. And so Joseph of Arimathea goes to Pilate to get the body, and Pilate inquires of the centurion. Before they do anything, they want to make sure he's dead. So the centurion, trying to protect his phony baloney job, takes a spear and spears underneath the ribs of Jesus going up into the pericardium where his heart is and pulls it out. And the Gospels say that what came out was blood and water showing that he was dead. And it doesn't matter which side you go under the ribs, the Romans knew how to kill you because they were soldiers trained in this. They aimed for the heart. They went straight up into his body cavity and yanked out a big old bunch of blood and water. And Jesus was certainly dead. If not dead from uh, previous, he certainly was dead by now. So the whole theory that Jesus revived in the cool tomb after three days of laying there is preposterous. Perhaps some well-meaning scientist would like to try that. <laughs> and so when he found out from the centurion, he granted that the body be given to Joseph. And he bought fine linen and took him down and wrapped him in the linen. And he laid him in a tomb in which had been hewn out of rock. And he rolled a stone against the door into the tomb. And Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, observed where he was laid. It turns out that it's not just Joseph of Arimathea, it's also Nicodemus. The other Gospels tell us Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, these very well-respected, wealthy men on the Sanhedrin, and yet they were not part of those who condemned him to death. They're the undercover brothers who come out from under the covers, request the body of Jesus, and at their own expense, they, they buy linen, they wrap his body, because they've got to hurry up and get him into the tomb Joseph of Arimathea is putting Jesus in his own place, in his own tomb. And it was hand-carved, by the way. That's expensive work. You've got to hire people to carve out a cave for you. Can you imagine? You think your job's hard. But it's okay, because Sunday's coming. He's not going to need it for more than three days. Amen. It's like a U-Haul. So they put him in the tomb, and the Marys know where Jesus was laid because the disciples weren't around. There was nobody with any connection to Jesus other than the ladies who stuck there and John. And so they prepare his body, and they wrap him quickly before the sun goes down because if you know anything about the Jewish culture, that means you've got to be hunkered down because there's no labor on that day. It's a special Sabbath. You've got to be home. You got to have the door closed and then you can take it easy. So they had to hurry up and do this. Do you realize that Joseph of Arimathea, being a very deeply religious man, and also Nicodemus and those who were with him, none of them could participate in the feast. None of them could go to the temple because they were handling a dead body. And according to the Old Testament, if you do that, then you have to sequester yourself and, and make sure you're clean by washing and waiting. Make sure no disease has laid hold of you. And Jesus said, it is finished. The word that he said is tetelestai, which means the debt is paid in full. Your debt, my debt, is paid in full. Amen. Next week, we're going to look at the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen.